Joining Lorna Simpson in conversation today, we have Thelma Golden. Thelma is the director and chief curator of the Studio Museum in Harlem. Um, I found out that these uh, fantastic uh, two speakers have three decades of friendship uh, and they've known each other for that period of time. So I look forward to hearing their insights. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. We are thrilled to be here. Aren't we thrilled to be here? Absolutely. It's amazing. And the reason we're thrilled to be here is to be in the presence of this amazing, fantastic new body of work that you have made. So, you know, I think that it is important. As the introduction said, Lorna has a multi, I hate when it, 30, that we've known each other for 30 years because we're only 40. Which Babies. makes it right, which makes it very hard to reconcile, right? How we could have known each other for 30 years. But you know, I've had the privilege to know your work through that expanse of time and through the many bodies of work you made in that period. And I think what's so exciting is to sit among this work that is so very new for you, but reaching in ways out towards the future of your practice. And I think it's incredibly amazing and courageous when artists take a step forward and you take in a big one with this body of work. But last night, um, our friend, my colleague, Ivana Blaswick, said to me that when she walked into the gallery and saw the collages, it felt like a passport between your past work and this body of work. So let's start at the beginning of the exhibition and talk about how this body of work began. What was the day that you began to think sort of beyond where you were and moving into where we are now? Well, it's interesting. I mean, I, this body of work did begin at, at Prince New York last year as a presentation, actually, as a kind of inaugural uh, presentation for Hauser and Worth in New York. And in doing that body of work for uh, Freeze as a single presentation, I felt like, well, that's amazing um, mm -hmm. in terms of I kind of configured it for that space. But then thought, knowing that a show was coming uh, in a few months, that, that that wasn't going to be it, that there was more to mine and there mm -hmm. were other things that I wanted to do with that. But I have to say, like over the past five or six years, um, those collages, which I guess maybe it's an eight year period, mm -hmm. it's like, that's like a selection of um, collages that I've done um, for th that I wanted to kind of curate in and around the themes within this uh, selection of work. But I always had in my mind, and even kind of as a proposal, of having that as a key feature of a uh, work of an exhibition that then other things would be operating, and that you would see the work through the lens of the collages. So the collages kind of serve as, as a practice for me, as a way of my own subconscious. So, you know, there are not many, very many elements that are contained within them. It's kind of very binary, just do one thing up against another thing. Most of the source imagery is kind of press photos from defunct uh, newspapers that are just selling off their archive. And, you know, you, I kind of find out a lot about what I'm thinking <laughs> as I make these collages. There are women on fire, there are women sitting on ice, there are women in, looking completely calm um, and collected while, or dancing while on fire or, or just bursting into flames. And so after a while of making collages that I kind of would just come across, I would kind of then pursue those themes that I was just coming up with subconsciously, which is interesting. So it provides this window into my own subconscious for myself, that then those elements help to fuel the paintings mm -hmm. and the other works that come out of that. Right. And as you mentioned, mm -hmm. it really is a way to sort of catalog the themes that have been present in the work. And in particular, in this body of collages, those themes are women. Can you talk yeah. about your use of the female form, female psyche, female identity, and your use of these images as they're found, and mm -hmm. how you think about the meaning of these images that exist in the world. Um, I, it's interesting, I mean, as I think of, and there's one trope within the collages that has this, um, in the news photographs, a fascination with uh, 
wild animals as domesticated pets. And so there are all these images I kept finding of deer in domestic situations. Here's a deer at the sink. Here's a deer like lay with its head on a pillow. And, it, and you know, the word deer is like deer as in uh, kind of has this feminine charge mm -hmm. to it. Um, but thought that it was a, just this weird fascination um, and that, you know, the deers weren't going off to work. They weren't like working under a truck. They weren't doing other kind of, they were very gender specific kind of environments where these animals were photographed. Um, and to just play with that idea. Mm -hmm. So I think um, it is, or for instance, like the snowball, I mean, it, it, it literally it's a photograph of a snowball that was created that's about this height mm -hmm. and judging against architectural elements of a woman on a snowball. And I just thought, how absurd is that? And then mm -hmm. just placing a face on it. And again, um, there's other, I have a snow woman, that's another part of uh, another set of collages. So I, I think I kind of see this absurdity in terms of um, very, not so much stereotypes, but these kind of very surreal presentations in and around these notions of femininity or kind of against this kind of masculinity that I, because there are women in armor, although the, the, the kind of decor and the uh, decoration that kind of a, uh, appears on these armored suits um, are kind of filigreed and elaborate as decoration. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I just kind of saw an interesting um, way to play with that and that it yeah. then kind of spirals into being a bit more surreal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, in a way that's something that has been in your work from the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. This sort of examination of the way in which images speak, the way in which we read them, the way in which they have a historic context, but then when we look at them in the present moment, um, they seem very different or read very differently. And it feels that in this particular moment that you're taking these images from the past, but as you describe this absurdity, right, in these images of women, it seems rooted very much in the present. Right? That you're looking at them with present eyes. So moving from the collage, you know, this exhibition includes painting and sculpture, two forms that you have worked with somewhat in the past, but very fully realized in this body of work. Mm -hmm. What made you begin to think about painting? <laughs> I, that took a turn there. I didn't think you were going to end oh. on the word painting. Oh, what do you <laughs> like, why is sculpture? You okay. can answer no. no we're no, going to start okay. with painting. We'll start, we'll start with the painting. We'll start with painting. Um, no, the paint, the, the, I mean, and it's funny. Um, it really began because I started doing, and now more than maybe 10 years mm -hmm. ago, like uh, collages um, and these kind of drawings, maybe more than that period of time. Now I'm just thinking, why am I working on these small works of paper uh, in this way after doing it for about five years? And so I should you know, do something a little bit more adventurous. Like, what would it be like to make them larger? And I'm going to embarrass him, but yeah. Glenn Ligon is here. And I just said to myself, maybe I'll just call Glenn and ask, like, so what kind of surface should I use? <laughs> <laughs> but it was also the embarrassment because, like, you know, I, I do have, you know, people in my life who are amazing painters, some of whom are here. And they are like, you know, renowned and really well. And I'm like, excuse me, I'm thinking about that painting thing. I mean, like, you know, I just like to, how does that work, really? But that was very you. <laughs> and in I was a way. very embarrassed, but I was also embarrassed. And Glenn was like, oh no, here, I just called this guy. He makes like great, you know, panels and stuff. But it was a thing of like, okay, this is going to be really funny that I'm going to have these friends now, you know, critique, ask them my, their opinion. But it, so it was more, I was more embarrassed in terms of the milieu of people around me than I thought anything in terms of the art world um, because they are so accomplished. But with that in mind, it also gave me um, the kind of ambition. I was like, why the hell not? Like, if not now, then when? Mm -hmm. um, so then, I don't know, I, I kind of then just jumped into it like a collector friend, Pamela Joyner, invited me uh, to her newly formed artist retreat in Sonoma, California, which was really amazing. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna bring some shit and I'm gonna just lay it out there in Sonoma, in the, you know, by myself. And she has like this amazing um, residence for artists that you're all by yourself. And I'm just gonna see what happens. And I did. And I kind of survived an earthquake, which kind of put it into like, wow, so me really taking up painting, I got to survive a fucking earthquake and <laughs> get out of it. And like, so we became, of course, really close. Um, 
And it was interesting because then not shortly after that, as Okui, and we're very close to Okui and Wazer, who is doing uh, the uh, 47th uh, Venice. Venice Biennale. And although we're very close and our daughters have grown up together, it was like, okay, so where's your proposal? You gotta make right. me a proposal. It was like, mm -hmm. okay. And you know, I had a few of these panels where you know, I said, you know, I'm just thinking about these paintings and I showed him maybe a couple of things and he was like, okay, what else you got? And I was like, that's all I got. I got some ideas that I could kind of <laughs> demonstrate mm -hmm. to you, but I don't have, mm -hmm. like there aren't 20 of them yet. Mm -hmm. um, so there was actually a lot of back and forth and a lot of like, he was skeptical, but I was kind of, you know, I had to chat him up a bit and like, you know, keep proposing. And he relented, thank God. And um, I just said, okay, so I'm gonna make them. And like, you know, okay. and then it wasn't hard to me. Like, like, he says, okay, three. And I was like, no, five, no, four, no, five. And we went back and forth and then Venice happened. So it was really, I feel like I work in public a lot. Like I don't, I have the nerve to be like, I'm gonna do something new. I'm gonna do it in Venice if I can get in Venice. And I don't care, it's gonna fail, it's gonna, it's gonna be good, it's gonna be whatever it is, but I'm gonna give it my best and see what happens. Um, rather than like working on it for five years quietly and then introducing it and saying, oh, well, there's a range of 20 things. I, I haven't released them yet. They're very private, like I never work like that. It's always very much in public for some reason. Um, and that's kind of how mm -hmm. it began. Mm -hmm. So really with this impetus to try something new, because, you know, it should be said, though, it's obvious. I mean, you know, here in London, you know, you all have had the opportunity of having that amazing room of Lorna's work at the Tate, right? Mm -hmm. And seeing this historic trajectory, you know, of her work. So let's just say you had done some other things really well. Yeah. Photographic work, conceptual works, using photography, video, you'd begun drawing. So in principle, if you hadn't done anything else, it would have been good. okay. Be, it would be, be totally all okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I just want to put that on the table. So when you call Glenn to say, I want to be a painter, <laughs> you know, maybe all of our response was a little bit like, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So you then have these paintings to make. How did you approach what it meant to make a painting? And I mean that by you had a whole way of working compositionally, aesthetically, even ideologically. Yeah. in these other media. So how did you come to those first panels? And then we're going to get to how you came to okay, these. I have to bring up Glenn again. Go ahead, because I'll talk about it too. <laughs> Glenn has an Instagram. And on his Instagram, he posted, um, from, he posted a photograph from maybe 20 years ago of riding a bike and kind of this moment of like learning, and which we all remember, uh, which is very funny. But it is kind of like, riding a bike, like I kind of, the first foray into it, um, and even my assistants are here, I'd be working, and I was like, and I'd step away, I was like, is it done? I was like, shit, I think that's done. Like, it was magical, it's, it's as though, because I was, when I went into undergraduate school, I started as a painter, um, and kind of quickly gave up, because I was like, oh my God, everybody who's two years ahead of me is so much better than I am. Let me just quit this shit now, and figure out something else. Mm -hmm. I was very intimidated. Um, but there was something about that foundation, like mm -hmm. a, a year and a half or two years of painting, that something in mark making had remained mm -hmm. over all this course of time. So I'm not saying I'm brilliant, but there was something about my ease in, with mark making mm -hmm. that it just kind of would just happen. And it was just like, I was like, this is like magic. I mean, mm -hmm. like, I could, I don't know, it was very, like, it was not. I'm not saying it, it, it involved in terms of subject matter and what I was doing, or, but something in the execution scene was surprisingly, um, uh, e came with ease. Mm -hmm. Although I was a little bit freaked out, of course, in what I was doing. Um, but, but it was always like, stop before you mess it up. Mm -hmm. Like, is, this is enough, just walk away from mm -hmm. it now. Mm -hmm. um, so. Th I guess in all the different mediums and genres and things that I do, mm -hmm. there is this level of discomfort and not being comfortable with what I do. I mean, there's another piece called 1957-2009 um, that was based on found photographs um, that I um, found on eBay of a woman from that year, from 1957. Um, in Los Angeles, black woman um, between the months of uh, June through August or something. And they're kind of pinup photographs of her and photographs uh, 
as if it was for a portfolio, for mm -hmm. becoming an actress, um, but very formally kind of posed photographs by a photographer, but somewhat an amateur Mm -hmm. in terms of lighting. And I kind of pinned all, it was about 300 of them that I had found online um, and pinned them up on the wall and I looked at them and I was like, my God, that's amazing. S you know, what would I, what would be an interesting way uh, to make a piece with this work? And the first thought I had was like, oh, to kind of insert oneself um, seamlessly as a doppelganger. Um, in this kind of repetitious <coughs> photographic mm -hmm. uh, display or, or uh, ambition that she had over th this uh, archive of images. And then I said, shit, but I don't like being in front of a camera. So that was like, it was a great idea and my daughter uh, Zora helped take photographs and kind of helped um, arrange it. But it, I was in such a bad mood the entire time. I hated every moment of it and up until we got to the end. So it is this thing of at my relationship to my practice isn't always like, oh, this is so relaxing and effortless and it's so happy to make this and I have it all worked out. There's usually more and more some kind of conflict or tension, tension mm -hmm. and uh, unease mm -hmm. with proceeding and kind of having to say, well, let's just see what happens. Mm -hmm. So I think it's my um, interest in process as part of what fuels the work as mm -hmm. well. I mean, it's nice to be able to finish some stuff and have things finished uh, in a way, but it, it, it also may have to fulfill some sort of uh, interest for me in terms of my process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How did you make this body of work? And then um, can you talk about specifically the themes in these works? I mean, ice. How do they make them? Well, I don't <laughs> mean in a technical way in the yeah. pure, but I, I, they are constructed yeah. through a couple different processes, right. which I think as viewers, when we are in front of them, we feel that. And if you could talk a little bit about how you've created in them, both your sort of the, the large expanse of them, but very specifically the way in which the detail plays out based on the layers right. and the color palette. Um, okay. Okay, how did I make them? They are <laughs> uh, panels, either wood or fiberglass mm -hmm. surface with gesso, but it kind of begins with um, really a collage mm -hmm. technique of uh, using different elements from found photographs. So part of the found stuff is like a volcanic eruption which creates these dark clouds and then uh, icicles and then uh, mm -hmm. mountainous kind of ice or glaciers mm -hmm. um, and then all combined and mixed up together and then that gets sent to the silk screener and then the panels come back to the studio but very in a very rough mm -hmm. way and then they get painted mm -hmm. um, and kind of uh, fused and kind of um, altered by the ink and maybe a little here and there acrylic and there's also kind of strips of magazine mm -hmm. uh, copy that comes out of the ebony magazines um, and with this series, which is montage, mm -hmm. um, it too source material is from uh, Ebony Magazine as one article was about kind of suicides and the other one I think depression. And what was interesting to me was the, I mean I actually made a piece that kind of had each image on mm -hmm. a, like panels this big and it came back to the, st like maybe three or so years ago. And it came back to the studio and I was like, oh, no, I'm not ready for this. This is like too much. Mm -hmm. And I kind of felt like, okay, that wasn't a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, so they went back into storage. But in preparation for the show, um, one of my studio uh, managers said to me like, well, why don't you take a, why, why don't we drag that back out of st uh, storage? You should look, take a look at it again. Mm -hmm. And I did, and this time I was like, oh, it's just the wrong format. Mm -hmm. But it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. So I then kind of re, uh, uh, what did I want to say, um, reproportioned mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. and kind of uh, spliced them together in a way that I thought was much more effective in terms of their scale to one another. But they became like the single figure mm -hmm. that is kind of fused together and the mm -hmm. palette is somewhat nocturnal and um, is this waking or dreaming state between a precarious situation but the woman on the bed is fully clothed mm -hmm. in her shoes so it's not a kind of relaxed sleep. Mm -hmm. um, it's something else. Like a tumultuous dream of a sort. Exactly, of a sort. Kind of. And somewhat, so all of this is like the landscape is this yeah. backdrop of uh, foreboding doom, I guess, mm -hmm. um, mixed with um, also the psychological state that's mm -hmm. kind of repeated in these panels in montage, which mm -hmm. I guess kind of has a lot to do with how I feel 
you know, just living in America is mm -hmm. right now as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so in that way, I think it is this kind of not only the day-to-day -day practicalities of what's going on in the United States, um, but certainly the psychological kind of effect of it um, okay. as this kind of uh, ongoing, uh, I don't know, know what else to right. say. I'm like a little bit lost for words on yeah. that. But, um, no, no, that makes total sense. And I think that the literal way in which that plays out is so many of these images come from these magazines from the 60s. Right and you are using them now, but there's a sort of similar sense, right, of, of the kind of psychological impact of what it sure. means to be living in this environment at, at this moment. Oh. So with that, can we talk about the sculptures? Please. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't a question, that was just an invitation oh, okay. for you to tell us. Segue, segue. Segue into, into the um, sculpture. Um, the sculptures too, uh, we kind of started beginning them last year, but um, they are the so source, I mean the magazines are the source material for a lot of the work in terms of subject matter, um, but certainly in terms of the collages and everything. But in the studio, um, I have stacks and stacks of them and the stacks get organized by decade or... Where do you find them, Lorna? How do you find them? Why don't you say a little bit a little about bit. Ebony and Jet Magazine oh, as okay. a source? As a source. Yeah, just for um, context. I grew up with uh, Ebony and Jet Magazine. My grandmother and my mother were uh, from Chicago, uh, Illinois. So I remember at, I don't know, it was eight or ten years old, but the opening of Johnson Publishing, which was on Michigan Avenue in Chicago. And, and kind of for black people, it was like, this feat for a black company to own this kind of giant slab of real estate on the Magic Mile in Michi or of, on Michigan Avenue. Um, and remember going on tours of the buildings and my parents were very much interested in the arts and in uh, theater and uh, museums as well, but also architecture. So it was a really big deal. And I remember visiting that and my grandmother also had Ebony magazines. Um, and so many years later, um, just going through things at the studio, I had a bunch of Ebony magazines that belonged to my grandmother, and I was like, this is incredible. I was just kind of fascinated at looking mm -hmm. at them, and then started to think, oh, this would be interesting just to play with this, and so began playing with them. And then I, you know, a kind of, there used to be a flea market around, the, which is like a dream. I love flea markets, and the fact that one opened up at least less than like a few steps away from my house every Saturday was like a dream come true, although my neighbors hated it. But I ran, would run into um, flea market sellers that were also selling black memorabilia. So I became friends with one of these guys and he became my picker. So he would kind of go to different flea markets, um, kind of from uh, Texas into, I don't know, from Florida into mm -hmm. Texas and would kind of collect mm -hmm. them for on my behalf, which was really great as well. I mean, we're finding them harder and harder to find uh, these days. But that in having those stacks, they became kind of, I, I was thinking that of the, them as these objects, and that in all this kind of, in terms of the paintings with the ice, mm -hmm. you know, kind of really fascinated by glass that could be slumped. It's like made with a foundry in South Jersey called Wheaton Arts. Um, which are kind of free-formed uh, glass that has this kind of square, mm -hmm. kind of slumping of the kind mm -hmm. of liquidity of yeah. something from being in one form moving mm -hmm. into another still remains, but they become prisons and lenses onto these stacks of magazines mm -hmm. um, and kind of weight. So the, it's kind of just really taking it to the nth degree of the snow and ice and melting and prisms and um, weight thing mm -hmm. um, into a kind of much more physical sense. Mm -hmm. um, and then yeah. finally the snowball. The snowball. So that comes from an image you already mentioned. Right. And your decision, because in many ways she feels sort of at the center of all of this work, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That it sort of makes manifest this idea of these images that you first began looking at, gendered images and images of women, the absurdity of the way in which they existed, mostly mm -hmm. in those magazines in both advertising, but mm -hmm. also editorial mm -hmm. photographs. Um, and then, of course, combining it with these images of extreme weather that mm -hmm. were coming in the painting. How did I come to that? How, did, how <laughs> does she help yeah. us um, make sense of, again, where all of this, this work place. sits? Well, I mean, like, you know, I mean, it's a snowball. <laughs> um, she is perched on top 
of a snowball. So it's, you know, just as someone, mm -hmm. like the woman is like teetering on the edge of a ledge. Yeah. Um, and I mean, even in making the sculpture it relies on a certain amount of stability in order for that balance to mm -hmm. be created. So in some ways there is this, it's kind of this precariousness. I mean, she mm -hmm. doesn't look that comfortable. She can't stay up there forever. Just as like you can't stay yeah. out on the ledge mm -hmm. forever. Um, and so there's there's a sense of precariousness, or you know, what is the next movement that mm -hmm. will come, or the next thing that will happen? Um, and it just, you know, in some ways, um, I thought it interesting to explode one of the collages from kind of this two-dimensional, yeah. very flat scale to something three-dimensional, um, and um, but actually relies on a kind of real, mm -hmm. like this sculpture did exist, mm -hmm. and I'm really just making a relic or, or mm -hmm. refashioning something right. that was me yeah. mm -hmm. um, in a way. So that I kind of is interesting mm -hmm. as a conceptual idea mm -hmm. of these almost surreal collages to make something um, that looks just just as surreal, um, but to, to turn it into a three-dimensional object. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now that you see all of this up, when you're in the studio I now, am exhausted. I, I know that, but we're, <laughs> I, I, well. <laughs> and that's because you've made this big, incredible body of work, right? So that, the, but, but in the studio, you know, you sort of talked about the choices you were making. You've indicated the environment that this last year, particularly, you were working out of. But at core, what has fueled your studio practice through your career? Does it? That's an interesting question. What has fueled it? Yeah. I love doing it. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I feel very privileged that I have this drive and ability to create what it is I want to create. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes it, it has to be, uh, I have to be persistent, I have to fight for it in the sense of, uh, in, in the way, in terms of my commitment, of mm -hmm. maintaining my commitment to it um, against certain forces. But at the same time, I mean, I, I feel that's a very privileged problem to have, mm -hmm. to want to be able uh, to maintain one's commitment mm -hmm. to just bringing things into fruition. So. Um, that's what drives me. Mm -hmm. I think it's, um, I mean, I, I think at a certain age, like maybe eight or nine, I remember figuring out like people are just naming things and making things up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the names of companies, the names of drugs, what certain things look like, why they look that way is because that's someone's idea. Mm -hmm. And kind of felt like, well, should I? I have some ideas, mm -hmm. um, even before of really understanding yeah. the, but mm -hmm. like I thought it was, the world was much more ordered, well, and it may be perceived that way as well, but I thought things were much more ordered in the sense of that mm -hmm. there's a reason why something is like that. So I think, at, I don't know if I was, by the time I was 19, my confirmation of, was, of that was that haagen means nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was like, see? Mm -hmm. You think that means something, but the mm -hmm. ice cream means nothing. They mm -hmm. just made it. Like th mm -hmm. that, I remember years later was my confirmation. Mm -hmm. um, so I just felt like that's art. Yeah. Right. <laughs> In a way. Right, right. The ability to take ideas and make and them. And just bring them to fulfillment. Mm -hmm. and, and it's more mm -hmm. about then the process of which those things come to life. Mm -hmm than actually being worried as, as whether they're going to be mm -hmm. validated or mm -hmm. if they're any good. It's more mm -hmm. just wanting that engagement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Your work has always been fueled by a deep intensity towards your own explorations in the studio, but also a somewhat voracious interest in work outside of your own work, right? Mm -hmm. Other forms of art and just aspects of the culture. So what are some of those things that have been inspiring you um, or angering you, right, in this oh. moment that has helped inform this body of work? Oh. <laughs> oh, gonna go there? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I think, you know, as an artist mm -hmm. and, and, you know, being an old artist in that sense to this point, that it, it, the things are fueled by one's experience. Like, it's, it's almost impossible at this mm -hmm. point to say that my engagement is 100% my formal relationship to my work. Right. It has to do with my personal life. It has to be like, you know, kicking and screaming and fighting through divorces or leaving galleries or um, just political situations in terms of sometimes the way that I'm treated. I mean, like, it's great to be, uh, you know, somewhat celebrated artist, but, you know, in certain cer mm -hmm. situations or circumstance, the way that I am treated, I have to kind of set people straight. Mm -hmm. 
so um, do you, do or, or you create boundaries. And I think those experiences mm -hmm. and also, yeah, my day-to-day -day influences yeah. kind of the way work mm -hmm. gets worked out. But I think what I really think or mean yeah. is that, you know, the way in which you consume what's around you. Mm -hmm. right, seems to inform. So it feels like, for example, in using the ebony jet, that's just one aspect yeah. of a kind of, you know, black cultural manifestation that's right. inspired the work. I think music has had a lot to do yeah. in your work. So what are some of those themes or aspects of other artwork that have been important oh, to you recent, you know? In your it's, it's hard to say oh. right mm -hmm. now. I mean, I, I think, um, the varying collaborations that I've yeah. had in the past. Yeah. Jason Moran has been amazing in terms of the video work, which mm -hmm. you know, I keep getting asked, like, so when are you gonna make a video piece? I'm like, okay, one medium at a time right, right now. Um, when to make another one. Mm -hmm. But I, I would say, and even with Terry Atkins, a musician, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the late Terry Atkins, musician, mm -hmm. artist, yeah. um, composer, mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting. Um, those types of collaboration because it takes me mm -hmm. even further out of my own uh, expectations about my own or the boundaries of my own practice. Right. Mm -hmm. When you're in collaboration mm -hmm. with someone, um, you have to give them space and there has to be an openness in this exchange. Mm -hmm. So I would say those have been very vibrant mm -hmm. and really I treasure them and uh, have been really uh, eye-opening in terms of, you know, I have my idea, they have our, their idea, we have a conversation and then this thing evolves. Mm. Um, so it, it reminds me to remain open and w even when I am only working by myself mm -hmm. about my expectations of what the end product is going to look like mm -hmm. and w from where I begin and what it ends up to be that I should be a bit fluid about that. Mm -hmm. And so those collaborations have reinforced that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And has this body of work, now that, you know, taking the trajectory from as you um, thought about beginning to paint to seeing this work, how does it change your sense of your primary medium? Right? I, I don't know what my primary medium, no, that's not true. I think my primary medium or what influences everything is mm -hmm. photography mm -hmm. at the end of the day. I mean, mm -hmm. there's always some mm -hmm. photographic reference that is showing its head or that is mm -hmm duplicated uh, or the process of uh, co the copy and um, multiples and um, repetition mm -hmm. is really the mechanical plastics of right. photography mm -hmm. and print. Um, and that does, that's a thread that I think, mm -hmm. whether it's painting or the photography or the collages or drawing mm -hmm. um, and the reference points all point back to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does it, however, change your sense of where the work is going, though? thinking about the photographic image as your base. You know, you spoke a little bit about, for example, you know, in these works, starting at looking at other images. So the, the relationship between your making images and yeah. your use of images in the oh, world, yeah. how has that balance um, changed for, in your sense of photography as you've moved into painting and sculpture? Um, I I guess I'm not so concerned with authorship in mm. terms of my own taking of the image. Mm -hmm. Um, because I think even the images that I in quote unquote invent are based on something. Either mm -hmm. they're based on language mm -hmm. or they're based on some memory of something else that mm -hmm. I'm they're based on a painting, a kind of representation mm -hmm. of a painting in a way. Um, so I, my relationship to the image is always like, I mean, I feel like um, montage may be all found images, but the way that it's put together, not some, I, I'm not so concerned about, well, what is a photograph that Lorna Simpson took? Mm. Um, mm -hmm. Because I feel like they all have that mm -hmm. imprint of authorship, but at the same time, they call so much from a kind of visual language, mm -hmm. either by completely, you know, going to undergraduate school, art history, and then graduate school, um, in that way, I have an encyclopedic mind with, when it comes to that. So uh, they're all interchangeable mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't miss, like, oh, the, pull out the four by five camera and take it, you know. I don't quite miss that, but if in returning to video, I mean, I think maybe that's the, the composition of the frame and kind of working in video and film is really then more the arena of mm -hmm. a kind of re making a new image with a camera. Mm -hmm. I think still imagery, I'm more interested in um, culling and using archive and that it's probably within the film and video language mm -hmm. um, of inventing kind of 
that kind of will, I came up with this image and kind of to create this set or this circumstance to play out. Mm -hmm. And when thinking about this idea of the photographs, not those that you author, but those mm. that you call, it is this relationship to archive that's been important mm. in your work, and very specifically mm. in perhaps archiving yourself, those images that often go under-recognized for their mm. cultural history. So it feels like your work has always had an aspect to it where you're also looking to open up the sort of history of representation in sure. images. Sure. And how are you continuing to think about that? Particularly, as you said, in some ways, some parts of your archive we're getting further and further away from, right? For right, example, yeah. like, you know, Ebony and Jet as the sort of primary, you know, Bible of black imagery, right? right? I mean, I think when, you know, when you think about the archive and mm -hmm. you think about uh, images that are found images, it is that the, uh, once they become an archive and it's stepped away from, yeah. Returning to them takes them completely out of their context. Mm -hmm. So they become almost surreal just in the fact that they've been discarded and removed from their original purpose. Mm -hmm. And it is that, I mean, they look strangely vibrant to me as this new thing mm -hmm. uh, in a way mm -hmm. when once they are pulled out of their context. So then they become open to any kind of, to, to many different kinds of lenses. It's, it seems much more an open field of how you can then readdress the way that image operates. Mm -hmm. And I find that really interesting because even in going through images that I would find online and kind of just buying these and getting them back is kind of like almost like Christmas. Oh, I got some more pictures back from eBay. Let, let's look at them. Like yeah. when I look at them again, I was like, yep, that's about as crazy as it looked when I bought it, wow. you know, in a way. Mm -hmm. But it does open up a door of another, of another level of interpretation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's kind of interesting about it. To mm -hmm. me. What are you looking for when you look for images? Whether the ones you're buying Absurdity. or the ones? And why? Because they were, because I have a feeling they don't weren't seen as absurd. They you mean when of, they were made? When they were made, mm -hmm. um, and so therefore sometimes there's a kind of beauty to them. I mean, there's another one that I have, which is very funny because we both grew up in Queens, um, of a snow woman, mm -hmm. um, which is the same thing. It's a snow woman, but I mean very voluptuous. Like she has big breasts. She's sitting on her knees. She's very uh, kind of hourglass figure. She too is about maybe nine feet tall in front of someone's yard in Queens. So and then, made out of snow. Made out of snow. Right. In kind of the neighborhood we we were, grew up that in. we grew up in, because of kind of the architecture. Um, and the same thing, like, that's crazy mm -hmm. uh, to me, that someone kind of, you know, not only was it photographed, but like that sat out there for at least a few days, mm -hmm. because most of the snow around it was like melting. So it was, it was kind of. Uh, it was about mm -hmm. at that point to know. Mm -hmm. But I, I find those images like really interesting mm -hmm. and um, somewhat in altering them, their absurdity is kind of uh, revealed a little bit more, but then I create this kind of context mm -hmm. around it. So there's like this woman with this, like from a lot of the heads that appear in the images aren't a lot like the many famous individuals that appear yeah. in, mm -hmm. um, in Ebony Magazine, but actually are for hair ads. So mm -hmm. there are these extremely quaffed images of representation of hair mm -hmm. with these uh, kind of unknown mm -hmm. faces mm -hmm. that uh, are kind of through the entire magazine. And kind of just placing that, because those images are kind of uh, for wigs and representation of how, you know, how many different hues can come out of mm -hmm. your uh, adornment in terms of your hair, they are. They too are a little bit hyper real. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So it's it's that kind of play that I think um, is interesting. But again, I, I mean, it's such an easy art. It's like I feel like it's this easy, amazingly ac accessible, idiosyncratic archive um, that I can just select from very easily. Mm -hmm. Your work has always walked a brilliant line between content and form. Right? That, that you've you know, dug into these kind of incredible formal strategies to make works that are incredibly beautiful, really tactile, really speak to what they are, while having this sort of density right, of content and reference. And it seems that when you speak about picking images based on their absurdity, right, but perhaps not the perception at that time, it really goes to an important aspect of your work, which is opening up this conversation um, about identity and race and gender. And sure. some of that absurdity 
is based on the projections right, right. that yeah. those photographs made in those days about for example, the image of black women, mm -hmm. right? That looking at them now seem absurd, mm -hmm. but were part of a larger project mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. representation. Sure. So can you talk a little bit about this relationship to the history of representation that you, through oh. your work, have mined and opened up and reinvented and reinterpreted through, through your, the bodies of work you've made? Um, that's a very long question. Well, <laughs> you know, you, you can take a give short. Me a, give me a, give me a Well, I thought bit. it was so interesting because a I remembered when you just said how much you yeah. hated yeah. being in 1959, right? Like that work yeah. that was really the first work of yours, kind right, of, yeah. that you put yourself in, right? Yeah. And we've often had the experience that for about 15 years you made works, photographic works, with images of black women that everyone thought were you. Right. No matter how tall, how short, how, <laughs> yeah. right? right? Every single one of the works, people would go up, anytime we had a show, we'd go up to Lorna and say, oh, I saw you in your work. Mm. And Lorna would, you know, I could tell she'd get tight, you know? <laughs> and I would have to be the curator art historian. i say, well, no, actually, Lorna's not in her work. She uses a variety of models, though. They're meant to indicate the every womanness of black women. And Lorna would still be mad, right? Because she would be like, it's not me, right? right. So for a long time, right, yeah. you you made work, right, not about you, right. but about the idea right. of these images, right. right? Can you just talk about well, that? Well, I think, I mean, I'm interested in kind of opening things up. So in terms of either it's race or gender or sexuality mm -hmm. and kind of those constructions and those constructions over the course of decades mm -hmm. that I was never one to kind of land on one monolithic kind of solution or demonstration mm -hmm. of a particular identity as being it. So I'm very cautious in the work right. to really open things mm -hmm. up in such a way that we kind of relinquish some of these boundaries, okay. some of the, this mm -hmm. kind of um, socialized mm -hmm. um, marriage to these terms exactly. and to the way we, uh, more than the images, but the way we use language. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was very important to me um, that the work leave open for the viewer a certain sense of imagination, but also um, in the way that they might open up the way they think about their own lives, the way they think about the people around them, um, that whom they either love or hate, mm -hmm. um, but that we broaden that. And I think, I mean, I think now we've come to a point in history that um, we're f that finally is exploding in a way, and and. Um, the kind of evolution of the way that we speak about gender and maybe mm -hmm. the need for not that term at all, I mm -hmm. think is um, heartwarming to see and mm -hmm. to experience. Um, mm -hmm. And so it is that evolution. It's not something that I'm trying to define that there's one way. Because I mean, other things that people say, like there's this another piece called wigs, like, and it's about the way black women wear their hair. Yeah, right. Oh my God, and I would get the same face like, right. no, no, it's not that right. um, at all. Right. And kind of, I think in some ways, I will say, and part of the battle of, uh, and making choices, like, I mean, I think as an artist, you choose your family, you choose the people that are around mm -hmm. you. But it, I got very early on of having, having a lot of success as a young artist was the way that my work was spoken about, that it was highly problematic in a way, because it was only kind of, it would, I had to make choices, right. very specific choices, who I chose to write about the work or who I was in conversation with because most often it would be like, oh, well that's kind of about being a black woman. Mm -hmm. Or it's, oh, it's just about mm -hmm. the black experience. And I was always like, well, why can't this be about a universal experience, experience through, through the, the lens of, of right. um, an African-American mm -hmm. lens mm -hmm. in that way? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think th those choices over this, even the time that we've known each mm -hmm. other, that. Um, and I was telling, and Thelma knows this, like I don't read press very much because I'm, I'm not in control of it mm -hmm. in a way. But I am very much involved and controlled with like getting young people to write about my work, mm -hmm. young curators, people that I've had, you know, roping mm -hmm. in people that I've had relationships for 20 or 30 years and saying, but would you write something, just a small piece about this now? Mm -hmm. And I think as an artist, that is to who you are in conversation with and who your inner circle is mm -hmm. in terms of how you develop your, your practice and how you speak about mm -hmm. it is really important. Yeah. And I thank you mm. for being so much a part of that. Well, thank you. I think that your work um, has had to do a lot of work 
to make a, a lot of space. Oh, was that funny? I didn't mean no, that to be. It's wonderful. It's oh. nice that you're... Sorry. <laughs> family, it's family. Yeah. No, but your work, you know, has had to do a lot of work yeah. to open up a lot of space yeah. for lots of different kinds of practices to happen. So really what I think it really was, right? While I totally accept your read of kind of those early years and the narrowness with which sometimes people came to your work, but in some ways that narrowness was the path mm. into this wider lens that we're in now. Now I say that yeah. as the director of the Studio Museum in Harlem, having the privilege to work with multiple generations of artists, um, both past and present. Mm. And I know that because you did create so much space in your work by demanding wider readings, different readings, mm -hmm. and that those works physically, right, when they were hung in museums as they were, they changed mm -hmm. the narratives that had been around about race and gender in many ways that made it possible for people to see the possibility of many dialogues in art mm -hmm. about race and gender. So I think that um, you have to own that space, right, that you made, because it's huge. And there are many other artists um, that have been able to make work that is complicated and interesting and beautiful and can mine the idea of their work being a way to see and think through identity and gender in ways that are really profound and really powerful, and that is a result. Wow of the work you have made and the yeah. way in which those works did live in the world. Um, so that the fight that you fought yeah. has been won a bit <laughs> in the sort of widening of the space that we live in right now. Yeah. So I want to open it up to questions. <laughs> um, thank you so much. That's been amazing. Um, I guess I kind of, I'm going to sneak two in here. Um, in respect to risk taking, do you find that it's different now that you've been an established artist for so long and, and you're more comfortable taking risks within your work as opposed to when you were, I guess, I don't know, starting out, let's say? And then in respect to the scale that you're working with now is, is vastly different, mm -hmm. I would say. And is that, be because normally it's because of the weight of subject matter, but your subject matter has always been pretty heavy. And, and what you've been doing. So I'm wondering your choice in scale with the paintings. Um, and I don't wanna, well, I'm gonna bring why, up. Why the scale? Just, um, yeah, I guess we're aware if, if that's just an instinctive or is that more of a, because at this point I'm gonna reference another dead white guy and that's, it's very Rothko at this point, like for me. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, Rauschenberg kind of comes up a little bit as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm wondering if that's, why the scale? Unintentional in that way? Or? Well, I would say there were a lot of photographic works that were what? all large scale. Huge. So I actually started, I mean, I would apply for Guggenheim, and they would go, oh, in the photography department, can you bring it in a portfolio? And I was like, well, the photograph is about, I don't know, six feet by five feet. And they'd go, yeah, but we need a portfolio. So I always, I mean, I think what you're speaking, I understand what you're saying, and I think as um, images that have not, a lot of the large scale works that I did are actually much like, like that this. in that mm -hmm. they were paneled mm -hmm. and, and kind of fragmented, mm -hmm. like the image was not continuous. So the only mm -hmm. shift here is not so much the scale, but that the image is kind of continuous, but not really because it's collage. Mm -hmm. So for me, I don't, for me, this is not a shift in scale. I've always worked large. It was in fact the thing of drawing that kind of brought it down to like these, I was like, God, I don't know what it's like to work on a work on paper that's like eight by 10. Like that seems incredibly teeny to me. So mm -hmm. actually it's the reverse. Um, but I would say risk is risk, you know? I mean, I don't feel, I, I feel the same amount of nervousness in having this show. You know, there's not this thing of success that you feel like, got this, no big shit. Yeah, I got this. Mm -hmm. you know? No, I'm not that cocky. I mean, because my practice demands of me to kind of engage the work on a level that I don't feel comfortable. So there, that, and that's a demand between me and myself, not between me and my audience, not between me and my gallery. That is the kind of condition that I place on the work between me and me. Yeah. Thanks. Next door, the mic is behind you. Yeah. Thank you. 
Hello. Hi, Tracy. Hi, Lorna. Hi, Tracy. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, you know, I came here just for this and so excited and odd to be here. And, you know, when I saw the paintings, I was just like so absorbed with them and so, you know, just joyful because I'm enjoying them so much. But then when I started looking at the sculptures, at first it seemed simple, you know, then I started looking through the prism of the, the ice and I saw so many images that, you know, take me way back. And then it, it got, you know, deeper and deeper just going through the ice and seeing Barbara Jordan or Shaft in Africa. And how did you decide, you know, Oh, there's Which like, there's show. such a wealth of things in right. those stacks. <laughs> it wasn't hard. like every one, basically, they're mostly really great um, covers. Yeah. I mean, there was one cover that's actually in part of the vitrine, which I've refused to put in that. It's like um, uh, Ebony in Africa that has um, Miriam McCabe on the cover. Um, I was like, nah, that's not going. That's not going in this, you know, hidden in the stacks of um, magazines and wanted to keep that one for myself. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think Ebony has this amazing, in its history, chronicles um, African-American history, the kind of African liberation movement, movement um, politics with the United States, entertainment, entertainers who are political, um, the chronicling of their lives in a way. And so I think um, it had this kind of freedom uh, in terms of the way that it covered a kind of spectrum of African American life, intellect, and art that I find fascinating archive. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's not so much that it's a black magazine, it's more because of the lens and the writing and the tone of the writing. And the mm -hmm. tone of the writing most often is unapologetic mm -hmm. in a way that I find amazing. And then, you know, in looking at that and then you look at Life magazine, you kind of see a huge difference in terms of the perceptions around what is American life. Um, so in that way, yeah, they, they are really special. And even in cutting them up for collages, I was like, okay, but look at what's on the back of that other page before you start ripping that up. Um, and there are some that I've preserved that mm -hmm. are really amazing issues, mm -hmm. and particularly, you know, I guess from the 1940s through the civil rights era, because all of those voices from the civil rights era are chronicled you know, through the time of their life as starting as um, civil rights activists through the point of their death. So there's all these mm -hmm. articles of conversations and jokes and talking about family and, and then you kind of see the trajectory mm -hmm. of their lives in the chronicling, the cross chronicling of their mm -hmm. lives because they were thought as even not as huge figures at certain moments but important voices. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I think find them special. There's a lot of also in looking at them nostalgia, right? Because there's so much that, you know, those particular images and those moments bring. But I also think kind of coming into seeing this, your description, you know, of Ebony is exactly right because it, it really was about creating a black world, right? Ebony saw itself as depicting all aspects of Afro-America in its fullness against the narrow ways in which the community was depicted. And I think of that now, you know, as in the US, we are living in Black Panther fever, mm -hmm. right? And this idea of the depiction of a black world, wholly and unapologetically not at all invested, right. right, in a reactionary view of itself. And you see that that's what John Johnson was thinking right, about, exactly. right? Yeah. That that's how, what he was creating in every single issue that you'd have that experience of seeing this world reflected. And in the masthead. Yeah. Clearly every, detailed every in the masthead yeah. every month. Yeah. yeah. Other questions? Uh, hi, um, I've got a question you've already mentioned already about your process and you're very, very focused on process. And there's also, so there's a video of you on the Tape Britain website of an interview where you talked about um, when you're envisaging and creating uh, work, 90% of it is the process and only 10% is actually the end result. Um, so my question is, in that circumstance, is there a lot of really interesting, cool stuff that happens along the way that an audience never gets to see because we just get to see the <laughs> No, because I work so end. publicly, it's like all, I mean, no, I mean, like that was one experiment from three years ago that no one would get to see. And then 
I kind of put it away and then I think about it and then I throw it back out and I was like, oh, now I'm ready for that. Um, so I think, I mean, and that's, but that's rare. Usually I come to kind of some terms of negotiating it that I go, okay, I can deal with this and I kind of just do it. It was maybe, maybe in that specific moment, that piece, I wasn't ready to deal with it. But like, I think it's, um, like I said before, I work so publicly, it seems, quite often that I think it's not so much fearlessness, but I am not attached to the work like, oh wow, that process, was so, like I can't let go of this. I'm like, once I am done, then it has mm -hmm. to leave. Mm -hmm. Oh, it has to go out into the world in that mm -hmm. way. I wanted to refer to what you mentioned when you said when you started out, you had to sort of make a choice who you have a conversation with because yeah. people would try to put you into boxes. I, I use this word. And that your conversations were about the fact that you don't do black women issues or black issues, but you look through a prism of a black African-American artist. And because you use archives, I was wondering if it was ever tempting for you to use or to look into other cultures through the prism of an African-American artist. You mean as source material, would yes. I look into other well, cultures? Well, I, I guess, the com or that's how I take your work, is that you use these archives as well, as a conversation. And I was just wondering if you've ever been interested in having that conversation with another culture. With another culture? When I say another culture, <laughs> then sorry. I mean that, because your work is very, for me, or at least what I know, um, is very much um, based on an African-American sort of experience. Right. And I was just wondering if that experience doesn't make you also sometimes think, what is it like for me to look at, you know, oh, a German I think I culture? Understand. Yeah, I think I got your question yeah. now. Um, I mean, that question is kind of posed to me in a way of like when I have a show or like say this show, like, yeah, but so, or I guess maybe in the US, like, so how is your work received in Europe as an African-American? Or how is your work received in London? Or how might your work be perceived in Hong Kong? But that's a different culture. So I, I guess the way I'm interpreting your question is how does this work, how am I in conversations with people other than my own culture? Well, I kind of feel like, I, I'll put it to you this way. I have the arrogance to think that being African American that my shit can be very universal. And in that arrogance, I'm forcing everybody else to get on the same page. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so therefore, if I can go through, mm -hmm. I don't know, 10 years of art school, and that I can sit there and I can look at Kiki Smith's work and understand the use of universality of her work mm -hmm. and the skin and the body and its absence mm -hmm. and being flayed, how is it that I can understand that as universal, but mine isn't? Mm -hmm. Okay, questions. <laughs> yeah, I know, now you're scared. <laughs> Another question. Yeah, oh, you so have it, okay. I have, um, I have a question about, um, I, guess, I guess, what ice and snow and water kind of symbolize or um, kind of make you, make you think about or what you mean in, in these works mm -hmm. because there's a kind of like precarity and a kind of tension mm -hmm. Um, you know, what happens if when the snow or the ice melts right. um, and like, you know, mm -hmm. there's the melting yeah. ice above what the What happens when above the archives. is over? Exactly. Or it melts, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and also if that's in a kind of conversation about time and temporality or, and also about the kind of precarity of the archives themselves because you've got the right. ice over the archives. And I just wondered what that was for you as a kind of... Well, I mean, the culling of this archive, I mean, whether it's in the collages, which are from, I think, like the Baltimore Sun and maybe a couple other newspapers whose photo archives are kind of being sold off because there's no more use because everything is digital mm -hmm. uh, in a way. So there is, I mean, even inherent in the materials and the world that we live in now is being digital, that these modes of 
this kind of medium is are now becoming defunct. Mm -hmm. So it's not my so much my uh, nostalgia for these forms of communication and magazines and kind of hard copy, um, but they certainly reflect a different era. I mean, even within. Uh, montage and like you know the bende dot on some of them are really really huge is something that doesn't you know is not part of a process anymore mm -hmm. um, so I just think it, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, you know Ebony is, has gone through different hands and kind of different balances of its ownership whereas Jet is out of print net by this time as well those things change and will continue to change um, in terms of how we ingest information and how we hold on to it mm -hmm. or save it or kind of what we consider something to save yeah. and what remains mm -hmm. um, is shifting mm -hmm. as well. Or in some ways how to freeze time, time. right? Mm -hmm. how, how to stay within the moment um, that they're made. All right, I think we have time for one more question. I'm going to look over here just to make sure I'm not discriminating that against side the side of the, of the room. They don't want to. No, okay. That side of the room All right, not if not, to. I'm going to stay over here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, well, thank you both again for having this conversation with us here. Um, but my question is not necessarily about the work in the space, but more about your experience as an artist. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, Sorry, I'm leaning in. It's an accent thing. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> yes, I'm from the States. My ear, my ear. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I guess my question is mostly what supported you? So I'm a curator as well and, um, and work with a lot of artists and different things like that, but also young in my career. And so my question to you is kind of what supported you most in the beginnings of your career? Um, what's continuing to support you now to continue to produce work? Um, I'll also reflect, I'm originally from the States, obviously. Um, and working here, I find that there's a large uh, black arts movement for young artists here, as well as in the States and my peers there. Um, and so I'm thinking about us and what we can do now and just asking an elder kind of what your experience was in your support. I mean, elder. She I know. called us an oh, elder. Like, oh. <laughs> own it, girl, own it, own it, yes. Elder, Take it, elder. Man. Yeah. Well, that's an elder. Um, no, I mean, I really do think back to, I mean, and, well, Thelma's much younger than I am. I mean, she's a baby when I met her. Um, and she really was. And, <laughs> And what's interesting, it's really, it's not about these kind of movements in a larger sense. It's like, who do you consider your comrades? Who's going to uh, fuel your flame? Who are the people that you can talk to that will argue with you in kind of consistently uh, constructive ways? And that you are just curious and excited to hear about what they're doing. I think it is that conversation helps propel a kind of daily practice and just liveliness and thinking about things, but also in what one might produce. And I would say, you know, my generation or kind of the generation that Thelma kind of stepped into, there was a huge amount of entrepreneurship people are like, no, I'm going to make that movie, and I'm going, you know, I'm going to build this film thing, and I'm going to, you know, make this record company. I mean, so there was this sense, like, I'm not going to wait for anybody mm -hmm. to tell me what I can and cannot do. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to make it. And if, if you want to sit with me and talk about what I'm going to do, because I'm going to do it in the next three years, great. And like, mm -hmm. so there would be this exchange of ideas with this kind of optimism that there were no barriers to getting what you wanted to have done because if you relied on looking at things that you needed some assistance or confirmation, then it would never get done. And I think that was something that was germane to my generation in terms of, because they had seen kind of, you know, you used to own that record company, now you don't own it no more because you sold it for $5 and then they made $25 million. Mm -hmm. You know, or why would, uh, I, I mean, particularly in the music industry as musicians, like, oh, well, why don't you wear this clothes? You're like your spokesperson. And they were like, but why don't I fucking make the clothes myself? Why don't I, why don't I have my own line? Why don't I have my, why don't I have my own liquor line? Why don't I have my own record company? Like, why am I trying to work up a ladder when I can kind of be building the thing from the ground up? Mm -hmm. um, and we kind of just took that spirit for granted because we were all very inspired by one another and I think it is that energy that one should look for to surround oneself with people of like mind in that way. You don't have to agree that like, well, I hated that film he made, ooh. You know, like you don't have to love everything but you love the spirit by which that person is living their life and the things that they want to make and that they are 
also in the practice of how they do that, they are open and they are giving in the manner in which they do it. I know we all are going to want to spend more time in your exhibition. I also want to shout out for a minute and acknowledge Matthew Day Jackson, who has a beautiful exhibition <laughs> next door, as well, and say thank you all for being here tonight, and really thank you, Lorna, for this conversation. Thank you, Thelma, and so much. This is a, such a treat to do this with you, because she had not really seen any of this work, just in like, hey, I think I've done like little bits on Text. my phone. So it was, it's kind of exciting. exciting to have this conversation with you. Thank it you. It is, it is, and thank you all. Thank, thank you. you.